If you have an autoimmune thyroid condition, then you need to incorporate the foundations in order to restore your health. The week of August 19th, I'll be hosting a free five-day live event entitled The Foundations of Overcoming Graves' Disease and Hashimoto's. Each day that week, there will be a live call where I present multiple lessons on the foundations, and at the end of each call, there will be the opportunity to ask questions. I'll be rotating the times in order to accommodate those in different time zones, and everything will also be recorded. To register for this free online event, visit thyroidfoundations.com. Hey, this is Dr. Eric, and this is another Your Thyroid Questions Answer Q&A episode where I will answer questions from multiple people. Once again, I plan on doing this every few months, and so if you have a question, please send it to info at naturalendocrinesolutions.com, and I'll try to answer as many as I can within a 30-minute period that I think will benefit many of the listeners. And feel free to leave your first name if you want me to shout you out. I got an overwhelming amount of questions this time, and so while I apologize in advance for not answering all questions that were submitted, I've decided to split this up into two separate episodes. Because a lot of the questions focus on hyperthyroidism, what I plan on doing is having a separate episode called Your Hyperthyroid Questions Answered, which will air in a couple of weeks. As for this episode, I will answer questions related to both hyperthyroidism and Hashimoto's. So let's start off with the first question, which is from Jessica. And Jessica's question is, where to get started with testing to see the origin of where I have or why I have Graves' disease? So again, where to get started with testing to see the origin of why I have Graves' disease is the question. And it's a good question. I mean, everybody's different and there's definitely different triggers and underlying imbalances. And so I will say with everybody, I do blood testing and I'm not going to go into detail with every single test I recommend, but I do a lot of basics. Obviously, I'm going to recommend a thyroid panel with antibodies, but that's not going to look at the origin. That's just going to tell you if you have a thyroid or autoimmune thyroid condition, you know, Graves, hyperthyroid in the presence of TSH receptor antibodies, specifically thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins. But I will look at nutrients, vitamin D, a complete iron panel, B12, and I will do a CBC with differential, a comprehensive metabolic panel, lipid panel, HSTP, which is C-reactive protein. It's an inflammatory marker, homocysteine. I usually will do some testing for viruses, which can be a factor in Graves' disease, such as Epstein-Barr. I like to do adrenal testing, either saliva testing or dried urine testing. So I've been doing adrenal testing for quite a long time because stress is a big factor with a lot of people. And while you could just assume that stress is a factor and treat adrenals, different patterns warrant different treatment options. I mean, obviously, regardless of what the adrenals look like, you can do things to block out time for stress management. But when I give specific recommendations, I do take into consideration how the adrenals look. So saliva testing or dried urine testing, you don't want to do blood testing because it's just a, they'll look at a single cortisol sample and you want to look at the circadian rhythm of cortisol. I do like hair mineral analysis testing to look at some of the minerals. Again, I don't rely on it on the minerals. I like to also look at blood testing, but it's not only mineral deficiencies, but toxic minerals like copper, for example, toxic metals. There are times when I'll do a comprehensive stool panel to see if someone has, whether it's pylori or parasites or other types of dysbiosis, organic acids testing. But to get back to your question, where do I get started? What I do is I do blood testing on everybody. I do adrenal testing. Typically, I do hair testing. And then it depends on the history of the person. I mean, you can't always go by symptoms. But if someone does have a lot of GI symptoms, I will recommend a comprehensive stool test. If they don't, then Maybe I won't initially, and, and maybe I won't at all, but you can't always rely on symptoms. People could have H. pylori, parasites, other issues with the gut without symptoms. So that's just something to keep in mind. So I uh, hope you found that helpful, Jessica. Definitely check out some of the other episodes on my podcast where I talk about more, more about triggers and underlying imbalances. Same thing on my website, naturalendocrinesolutions.com. All right, so the next question from Velvet is about the parathyroid. So pretty much her question is, would you be able to explain the function of the parathyroid? What happens when antibodies are attached to them? And what tests will help in diagnosis and treatment? What can one do when the parathyroid is involved? And 
I will be having an episode in the near future where I have an expert where I talk about parathyroid. So I, I'm not going to get into great detail here. I also have an article on my website, naturalendocrinesolutions.com. And I will say I'm not a parathyroid expert. So, I mean, the parathyroid glands to answer your question, far as the function. So the parathyroid glands located on the backside of the thyroid glands, and they're responsible for producing parathyroid hormone. And this hormone plays an important role in the regulation of calcium, phosphorus, as well as vitamin D. And so when calcium levels are low, the body responds by increasing the secretion of the parathyroid hormones. And this in turn will increase the calcium levels in the blood. And so in some you see what's called hyperparathyroidism, and this involves the excess production of parathyroid and you will see on a blood test elevated calcium levels. But you need to be careful because sometimes in hyperthyroidism, you'll see elevated calcium levels. So like if you have Graves' disease or any other type of hyperthyroid condition and you have elevated calcium on a comprehensive metabolic panel, this does not mean that you have hyperparathyroidism. It might mean that you have it, but then you want to do some further testing and you could test the parathyroid hormone, PTA, if that is out of range, that's when you probably want to see a, a specialist. And unfortunately, one of the more common causes of hyperparathyroidism is an adenoma, which is a benign tumor. And I say unfortunate just because I don't know of any natural treatments that are effective. And I've had people follow such a protocol under another practitioner. Again, I'm not an expert when it comes to treating parathyroid gland naturally. Um, just abnormalities of the parathyroid gland. And it's unlike thyroid conditions. So you mentioned antibodies. So I'm not aware of any autoimmune conditions involving the parathyroid gland. And again, it might be out there, just it's not like Graves and Hashimoto's, or at least again, not to my knowledge. But I'm recording this before I interview the specialist on the parathyroid. And so I will uh, try to remember to ask that question as far as like autoantibodies and the parathyroid, see what her response is. So good question. And again, there's more coming in a future episode. So the next question is from Vicky. And her question is, is killing your thyroid better than the side effects of PT? PTU is a type of antithyroid medication. So my doctor that PTU is bad and he wants me to do the radioactive iodine treatment to kill it. I would then be on Synthroid long-term, which is thyroid hormone replacement. I do have heart palpitation, so I'm considering it. So most endocrinologists will recommend methimazole over PTU, but if someone is not responding or not usually they'll respond to the methimazole, the problem with methimazole is that side effects are common causing the liver enzymes to elevate or depressing the white blood cell count, or if you're just not feeling well on it, maybe you have s certain symptoms. And so the endocrinologist said, well, let's take PTU instead. So the problem with PTU, I mean, it's similar to methimazole. I mean, it, it can cause side effects, but the concern with PTU is that there are a few case studies showing that it caused liver failure. Again, very rare. So I'm not trying to encourage anybody take PTU. Everything comes down to risk versus benefits. And if you do some research on PTU, you might come across those case studies. And understandably, endocrinologists are concerned about that. But again, I've had a good number of people on PTU over the years. Again, not my recommendation because I don't prescribe antithyroid medication, but they were taking it under the guidance of the medical doctor. And again, it's definitely not as many people were, have been on PTU when compared to methimazole, but a good amount have been on it where I could say that I have not seen anything really bad happen. It's not like I've seen thousands of people, maybe hundreds on PTU. And again, not nearly as many as methimazole. Like I said, I have not seen anything really bad as far as like liver failure. There's, I guess there's always that risk out there, but there's obviously a big risk when getting your thyroid ablated or getting your thyroid removed surgically. So it comes down to risk versus benefit. So I will say this. I mean, if I had to choose between taking PTU or getting radioactive iodine or thyroid surgery, I personally would choose the PTU. I'm pretty confident. Now, that being said, when I dealt with Graves' disease, I didn't take any antithyroid medication. I took 
herbs such as bugleweed and motherwort in my specific condition. L-carnitine in higher doses has antithyroid properties. I have a few episodes on the podcast where I talk about low dose naltrexone as a potential option, cholestyramine also as options. So there are other options besides antithyroid medication. I definitely would tune in some of those other episodes before resorting to radioactive iodine or, or thyroid surgery. Again, ultimately it's your choice. It's up to you. But even if you don't want to take PTU or if you listen to your doctor who's, who's encouraging you to get the radioactive iodine instead of the PTU, if you decide you don't want to get the radioactive iodine, but also don't want to take the PTU, then maybe look into the natural options, or again, maybe look into low-dose naltrexone or cholestyramine. So next question is, I'm still struggling with those TPO antibodies. I need to lower them more than I am now. I'm in the low 500s, but that's way too much. I feel great. My goiter is gone, which is wonderful. Entering 2024 with full 30 detox and then a veggie-only diet for 30 days to see if that will help. So any information you have, I would love to hear it. Thanks so much as always. Yeah, there's a few different questions related to thyroid antibodies. And I always tell people to tune into episode number 50, which you can check out by visiting savemythyroid.com forward slash 50. That's dedicated to lowering antibodies. But of course, there are other episodes where I talk about specific issues that can cause high antibodies. I mean, I talk about different categories of triggers. So there's food, there's stress, there's chemical, there's infections. So any of the episodes are related to these, which again, there's a lot of episodes that relate to the different topics and many of them are guest interviews. Some of them are solo episodes. I wish I could say that there's brand new information you know, over the last year, but really it does come down to finding and removing the triggers, correcting the underlying imbalances, which I make it sound easy, but definitely it's not. Uh, it's, it's not, or I make it sound easy when I just said it here, but you know, if you listen to the episode, you definitely will get to the episode 50 specifically. I think you'll get the impression that it's not easy, but it's definitely doable. So the next question is from Marissa. So how do you stop being hot with hyperthyroidism and Graves? And how do you bring down antibodies quickly? I went from 512 to 425 and my T3 1.3 and T4 4.0, TSA 0.01. I've had thyroid issues since taking the vaccine. And then she also asked, do you believe that EBOO, which is blood ozone with oxygenation, with light therapy, spike proteins out of my blood because that's what's attacking my thyroid. So... I will say I, I had ozone for when I dealt with chronic Lyme disease in uh, 2018 and also had uh, UV light therapy. So I'm not sure for the purpose you mentioned, but yeah, I mean, I do believe that there's benefits to IV ozone um, as well as UV light. But I mean, as far as, again, antibodies, I already mentioned episode 50, so say my thyroid forward slash 50. And then as far as stopping hot with hyperthyroidism, I mean, it's really lowering those thyroid hormones. I mean, obviously hormones, like other hormones, uh, like sex hormones, if someone has low estrogen, then that could cause hot flashes. But if we're talking specifically the heat intolerance associated with hyperthyroidism, then you want to do things to lower thyroid hormones. And if you're not taking thyroid medication, then as I mentioned previously, you might want to look into natural antithyroid agents such as bugleweed or higher doses of L-carnitine. So next question, if thyroid nodules are too small for biopsies and are monitored and may cause anxiety symptoms, shouldn't they be removed? I thought the whole idea of catching something early was the way to go. I mean, ideally you want to try to the cause of a problem of the nodules, which I also discuss in different episodes, two of the more common causes when it comes to thyroid nodules are problems with estrogen metabolism and insulin resistance. So I wouldn't say you want to like physically remove them, especially if they're small. I mean, you could do something like radio frequency ablation for thyroid nodules. Yeah, definitely don't want to do radioactive iodine for thyroid. I mean, I'm not a fan, as you know, when it comes to radioactive iodine, period. But when it comes to nodules, even like radio frequency ablation is more... I guess you could say more alternative. I don't know if I want to use the term natural, but could be expensive. It's not, maybe in some cases covered by insurance. For like smaller nodules, it's not 
usually an option. So I would say, yeah, you want to address the cause of the problem, which of course most endocrinologists don't do. And that being said, sometimes it can be challenging with thyroid nodules. It's not like I have 100% success where someone has even like larger thyroid nodules and then we do things naturally. They do a follow-up ultrasound. I'd love to say that every single person has their thyroid nodule shrink and, and completely disappear, but that's not always the case. But definitely there, I do have success in that area, but it's a person and, you know, not as concerning when they're small, but yeah, I mean, again, even in that case, it's nice to try to address the cause of the problem and see them decrease in the future on a ultrasound, on a follow-up ultrasound. So next question is from Herman. I have thyroid eye disease with elevated TSI antibody levels. Is there a natural treatment I can try to lower my TSI levels? So again, definitely tune in to episode 50, savemythyroid.com forward slash 50. That There are some things like selenium for both, not just TSI, but Thyroid peroxidase antibodies can sometimes be helpful. Having healthy vitamin D levels, you know, eating anti-inflammatory diet. Again, these are things I probably also covered during that episode, but just some things I could throw out here. But but yeah, definitely listen to that episode when it comes to lowering thyroid antibodies. So Jennifer asks, can hypothyroid be cured? And do you say that hypothyroid is the same as Hashimoto's? So, I mean, not all cases of hypothyroidism is Hashimoto's. Most cases of hypothyroidism are Hashimoto's or autoimmune in nature, just like most cases of hyperthyroidism is Graves, but there are exceptions. Some cases of hyperthyroidism are subacute thyroiditis or toxic multinodular goiter, and it's similar with hypothyroidism. Some, not all cases are Hashimoto's. It could be other cases. And so... I don't like to use the word cure, especially when it comes to Hashimoto's, because there is a genetic component. I, you know, I used a the word permanent remission. I know some people just don't like the term remission, but to me, permanent remission is very similar to, to cure. One could say maybe even synonymous. I was uh, diagnosed with Graves' disease in 2008, which again, like Hashimoto's, is autoimmune. And you know, I've been in remission since 2009. Now, thankfully, I haven't relapsed. So can I say I've been cured? I mean, it's been what, almost 15 years now since being in remission? And I think with cancer, they say if you've been in remission for five years, it's a cure. So maybe, I mean, I'm cautious about using, like I said, I like to think I'm in permanent remission, but obviously I don't know that for sure. There's always a chance of relapsing. So yeah, so you could definitely restore your health and even certain autoimmune hypothyroid conditions to a permanent state of remission, or again, in some cases cured for non-autoimmune, that maybe there's not a genetic component. I mean, if someone has congenital hypothyroidism, then I don't know an option, like a solution for that. But you know, if someone has, let's say, environmental toxins like xenoestrogens, and they're not causing an autoimmune response, but they're directly impacting the thyroid gland, then in this situation, by doing things to reduce your toxic burden and definitely minimizing exposure to xenoestrogens over time, then yeah, I would say in this case, the, that could be cured. But if it's autoimmune, I'm just cautious about using the word cure. I know some practitioners do. I can't say I never have done it, uh, especially years ago, but like I said, I, I like using the term permanent remission instead. So next question, I have heard that hyperthyroidism causes the thyroid to burn out and then you become hypothyroid. Is this true? What can prevent or delay it if it is true? I actually have a specific Q&A episode on this. I don't remember when it was released, but if you visit savemythyroid.com website and just click on podcast, and maybe do like a control F search and type in burnout. I forget what the question was specifically, but it was about this. Does the thyroid gland burn out? Something like that. And uh, the answer is, the quick answer is no, it doesn't burn out. But if someone has the antibodies for both Graves and Hashimoto, then over time they might become hypo. And so it's not the same as what the endocrinologist mentioned, burning out. I mean, if someone has subacute thyroiditis, they commonly will go from hyper to hypo. Most of the time will become euthyroid, which means they have normal thyroid hormone levels again, although that's not always the case. But yeah, definitely check out that Q&A episode. All right. So Lori, can you remind me of all the benefits of glutathione and how much I would need to take in a month to get results? I know it helps to get rid of heavy metals and reduces oxidative stress, but I think there are other benefits too. And the part that is specific to me is how many IVs in one month you think I would need to see results. They come in 500 milliliters to one liter options. 
do you have to take a binder with glutathione? Can you completely get rid of heavy metals with just glutathione? So I'm trying to answer as many questions as I can. So that's why I refer people to my website or podcast episodes. So I'm going to do the same in this case. You could visit, I might have a podcast episode on glutathione. I forgot, but I know I have an article on my website, naturalendocrinesolutions.com, where I go into detail about glutathione. So um, definitely check that out. Visit naturalendocrinesolutions.com. And there's a little search bar where you could do a search down and should come across that episode. And then as far as how many IVs, it really depends. I mean, and again, not everybody needs IVs. You know, like again, I commonly recommend like glycosome glutathione or NEC and acetylcysteine, which converts to glutathione. But, you know, assuming you tried that and if you're, you know, like specifically looking for, into the IVs, I would think at least maybe two or three of those. But, uh, you know, obviously you want to do things to reduce your toxic load as well. You know, just uh, do things in general to, or not general, but specifically like even like finding removing triggers to help reduce oxidative stress so your body's not using as much glutathione. That's also important too, because if you have a lot of oxidative stress, but you're not addressing the cause of the oxidative stress, then your body's going to need more glutathione. And as far as do you have to take a binder with glutathione? Do you need it in order to get rid of heavy metals? I've found that's not the case. I mean, there definitely there is a time and place for binders. Toxic molds, I commonly recommend a binder. So it's sometimes with certain heavy metals. I mean, I think cilantro, which isn't like a binder binder, that's obviously you could get that through the food, but you could also get it in supplement form too. But as far as there's like clay or zeolite or activated charcoal or synthetic binders like TMSA, DMPS, those I definitely don't think people need to take. But even the more natural binders, like NAC is a really good, it's been shown not only to convert into glutathione, but also act as a chelating agent. But again, there are some things like if someone has cadmium, then they might need a binder. Aluminum, silica is really good at binding to the aluminum. So it really just depends on the heavy metal and on the situation. All right. And so thanks for your question, Lori. And we got, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, um, Marika, M-A-R-I-C-A. Her question is about, I have a question about the TRAB range, which is a TSH receptor antibody range. I've been seeing comments in the Facebook group that once your numbers are under a certain amount, you're considered in range and you now are officially in remission from grade. What I find confusing is the in-range bit. Surely not everyone has Graves antibodies, so why aim for in-range numbers and not zero? Um, thank you for all the free content you put out and also for your awesome book. So much valuable information in it that nobody tells you about. Well, thank you, thank you. Thanks for checking out the book. Anyone listening to this who checked out my book, as well as my podcast, I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's definitely controversy over antibodies. I will say that you know, if you look at the research, some say that some antibodies are normal. Now, does that mean that just about everybody should have great antibodies as well? I mean, most people aren't going to test for those unless if they have graves. But I would say my goal with the antibodies is not just to get it within a range, but I find that in many cases, we're not getting it to zero. Now, in some cases, like I just had someone with Graves disease and you know her antibodies now are less than 0 0.10. And there's different ranges when it comes to Graves. Some labs use a percentage, but with her, like it was less than 0.55. That's the range. So like if she's 0.54, she would be considered within range, but that's still on the higher side. Yeah, of course, I love like in her, her situation where it's less than 0 0.10. And some people I'll see it like less than 0.3. And that's where it comes down to early when I said like cure versus remission, even the person who is less than 0 0.10, you know, are they truly cured? So, I mean, my goal is to try to get it as low as possible, but at the same time, if like, you know, I'm working with someone and, you know, they've done a good number of testing and done everything they can from a diet and lifestyle standpoint and their numbers, their thyroid panel numbers look great. Antibodies are well below the reference range, but still not completely negative. Again, I'm not going to tell them, well, let's you know spend, keep on spending money on more tests. I mean, some people might want to do that, 
But I mean, usually they don't. Usually they want to do that if the antibodies aren't normal and it's, we're struggling to get the antibodies within the range, then obviously some people want to dig deeper and I'll want to dig deeper as well. But if the numbers are well within the reference range, if they're on the higher end of the reference range, I'm not too happy and I would try to do things to get it lower. But like I said, if it's significantly below the range, but not negative, it's really up to the person. But I think it's fair to say, okay, let's continue to do things to maintain a state of wellness and just monitor your numbers, monitor your antibodies. If you want to do it more frequently, like for many people, it's, I think it's fine doing it like once a year, especially like antibody. If someone wants to do them, you know, like two, three times a year, even quarterly, maybe initially just to make sure they're not increasing, that would be fine. And then next question is from Maria. So what diet should you eat with thyroid issues? There's so many opinions out there. Also, how do you switch from pharma meds to herbs? Uh, thanks for all that you do. All right. Well, thanks for your question, Maria. So, I mean, as far as the second question, how do you switch from pharma meds to herbs? I can't tell someone like to switch to like taking their meds. But, you know, in the case of, you know, let's say... Hashimoto's, you know, because again, there's a lot of questions with hyper, but it also applies to hyper. So, well, you know, for if someone's on thyroid hormone replacement, which again, I wouldn't say is necessarily medication, like it's again, it's more of a replacement. Well, I will say this there's really no herbal replacement for thyroid hormone replacement, but if someone, you know, if we're restoring someone's health and they need less of the thyroid hormone, they'll start hyper because that's what will happen if someone takes thyroid hormone and they don't need it. Now, as far as antithyroid medication, if someone's taking methimazole and they want to make the transition to bugleweed, I wouldn't say, I can't tell someone, okay, stop taking methimazole and take bugleweed. And I wouldn't tell someone to do that anyway. What I would say is, you know, continue taking the medication, take the bugleweed in addition, maybe not take it right next to it, maybe like 30, 45 minutes apart from the antithyroid medication. And then if the bugleweed does its job to be more eventually more on the hypo side, and then the prescribing doctor should lower the dose of the methimazole. And then really that's how you're making that transition is really just relying more over time on the herbs and less on the medication. Oh, and then um, the diet, I almost forgot to answer that first question. What diet should you eat with thyroid issues? I mean, there's no perfect diet that fits everybody. You know, I'm actually coming out with a new book on hyperthyroidism that should be out with the first quarter. I, I'm pretty confident. Uh, I wasn't too confident a few months ago, but I think it will be out by March. And there's not just one diet option. So I'll spoil it for you. It's, uh, you know, I recommend for Graves and Hashimoto's autoimmune paleo AIP. But, you know, again, it's not like that's the perfect diet for everyone with Graves and Hashimoto. So there are other options like following a regular paleo diet is a good option for some people. Obviously, you want to focus on eating whole healthy foods, avoiding refined foods and sugars. I recommend for everybody to avoid gluten. I would say it's a good idea to avoid dairy. I usually recommend AIP or paleo. Now in the book, obviously I talk more about that because there are like variations, especially when someone has hyperthyroidism. But so nightshades are commonly, they're excluded from autoimmune paleo, but then there's also controversy with iodine in food, which AIP diet allows plenty of, like if someone wants to eat seaweed, for example, or kelp on an AIP diet, then usually there's no restrictions. But if someone has a thyroid condition, then having too much iodine might be a problem. And again, I'm definitely not anti-iodine. I've had experience with iodine in the past, but just the truth is some people don't do well with iodine. But yeah, definitely check out. I have some information on my podcast. And then in the upcoming months, is, I mean, for those with hyperthyroidism, definitely I would, of course, recommend my book, but then I will have also additional information surrounding the promotion of the book, talking more about diet. So definitely check that out. And and the information, some of it will also benefit those with Hashimoto. So even though the book focuses on hyper, some of the future episodes where I talk about diet, or if I do like Facebook lives and stuff like that, or challenges, again, if you've been following me for a while, I do have multiple events per year. So definitely get on my email list if you're not on my email list. And um, if you're not on my email list, just visit one of my websites, savemythyroid.com or naturalendocrinesolutions.com, and you'll get an opportunity to uh, get on my list.
So Marlene has a question here. How soon after the TSH, which again, thyroid stimulating hormone, becomes suppressed, can the levels rise following a natural protocol? And what additional steps can one take to promote the success restoration of a healthy TSH balance? Yeah, so I definitely have some episodes on the podcast about healthy TSH balance. And one of them is recent. And then another episode is how long does it take for the TSH to increase for those with hyperthyroidism? And the answer is both thyroid hormone levels need to be well within the reference range for TSH to start increasing, at least in most cases. And it could take a number of months to happen. So, you know, obviously if someone gets out of medication, it'd be a quicker process. But if someone is doing everything naturally, it could take more time for that to happen. Sometimes it could take six months. I'm not saying all the times, but again, it could take six months or longer in some cases for that TSH to increase. So I wouldn't stress out about the TSH. As long as everything else is improving, as long as the thyroid hormones are lo looking better and you know, you're feeling better or maybe other tests are looking better, to me, that's uh, more important because eventually TSH should normalize. So Frida has the next question, which is, are protein shakes the best way to get enough amino acids or glutamine or collagen powders? Which would you recommend? And how does perimenopause affect the thyroid and how can one boost libido? And uh, thank you for this platform. So thanks for your question, Frida. I mean, food is the best way to get enough amino acids. Like you definitely can supplement with protein. You might wonder, well, how can I possibly get enough protein through the diet? But yeah, you definitely could. I mean, if, if someone is more of a vegetarian or especially vegan, it could be very difficult. And then you want, might want to rely more on protein shakes. And I, you know, even though I'm not a vegan or vegetarian, I do eat meat. I also have a smoothie and I add some protein powder. Glutamine is just like a single amino acid. So you wouldn't want like just taking amino glutamine is insufficient. And collagen, I do like collagen powder too. It's just incomplete. So again, you wouldn't want to rely on collagen powder, but if you rely, I, I mean, there's like hydrolyzed beef or bone broth protein. I mean, a good organic pea protein. It's not AIP friendly, but that also could supply a good amount of protein. But again, it's these are all supplemental. To me, you wouldn't want to get most of your protein through shakes or supplementation. I mean, you could get like take an amino acid supplement, but again, you want to try to get as much as you can through food. There's actually an episode, a recent episode on perimenopause the relationship with the thyroid. And so I would tune into that. And, you know, as far as boosting libido, also there's episodes talking about that. I will say you need healthy adrenals to have healthy sex hormones. So that's usually the first place I focus on when someone has a low libido is trying to improve adrenals. And by improving health of adrenals, that could help uh, improving the sex hormones progesterone, testosterone, estrogen, and in turn, libido frequently will increase. I mean, some people need additional support to help, especially like with testosterone, like uh, maybe they need bioidentical testosterone in some cases, but there is a time and place for supplementing. But I would say try to do everything you can through diet and stress management when it comes to libido. I'll leave it at that. I was going to say something else, but more related to men. Like if someone has, you know, like if a male has like erectile dysfunction, then we might need to do things like improve like circulation and do other things from a supplement standpoint. Although again, those are, we want to still address the cause of the problem. We don't want someone to rely on supplements permanently. All right. So I'm going to answer a couple more, a few more questions here. And will heart issues I've developed since my grave disease diagnosis, such as arrhythmia and tachycardia, stop when the thyroid numbers get in the normal range, or are those things here to stay? I mean, tachycardia, I mean, almost always that will normalize because the tachycardia is related to the hyperthyroidism. I mean, there could be other things that cause tachycardia. And I know I have a, an article on the web, Natural Inner Solutions on tachycardia, the different causes. So you might want to check that out. I might have a podcast episode on tachycardia as well, but I know for sure there's an article on that. Arrhythmias many times are also normalized, but it does depend on the person. They won't always normalize. So I would say the majority of times they do seem to normalize. The tachycardia is completely different. That's elevated resting heart rate. But arrhythmias, that's something that many times it will normalize. 
is it will not. And Debbie, with this question, have any therapies such as PEMF, red light therapy, oxygen therapy, cryotherapy, compressed air squeeze, detox, sound therapy, AI-assisted weight resistance machines been found to benefit low thyroid? There is a center near me that offers these. I mean, red light therapy, I know there's some research behind that in thyroid health. I mean, all these others, I can't say I've done a lot of research with these, with most of these, like, you know, I'm obviously familiar with like, I mean, most of these I'm pretty much familiar with cryotherapy. I don't know, honestly, you know, some of these other, the one I'm not too familiar with, the compressed air squeeze detox. I'm not sure what that is, but these other ones here, I, again, I'm not sure is, is my honest answer. I just haven't dove into the, you know, I do a lot of research, but there's just so much time I have and I can't say I've researched everything. So um, red light therapy, I mean, you don't have to necessarily go to a center. You could get your own red light unit, but obviously everything comes down to cost. I mean, if you're going for a few sessions and probably less expensive going to like a center, but if you're going to do it on a regular basis, it might be more cost effective to get your own red light therapy unit because you could get a good one for, you know, like $400. Um, if you want like a whole body one, it'll be more expensive, but still, if you're spending, I don't know how much they charge. If it's like $50 a session, that's going to add up over time. All right. So let, I'm going to, okay. So what are your thoughts on AHCC, active hexose correlated compound to treat nodules in the presence of autoimmunity? I'm bringing this up. This is not a common question. This is the first time I've been asked this question, but it's interesting just because the study and it's there's a compound, active hexose correlated compound, that is pretty much just like it's a natural supplement with like mushrooms in there. And there was a study that shows that it could actually help benefit people with multinodule goiter, not the thyroid, like the thyroid was normal, the euthyroid, but it did seem to help with the shrinkage of nodules, which was very interesting and very small study. I think there was maybe 27 participants and you know, only half of them took the supplements, but it did show that those that took the supplement showed decreases in the nodules, whereas those that didn't showed an increase in the nodule size. I believe that's what I read. So very interesting. One of the concerns, so again, I don't know, I don't have experience with this, but yeah, it's something that's interesting and I might need to bring up and see, just have people do it. And then all I want to know is to, do follow-up ultrasounds. Again, it's challenging because I do other things too. So like if someone's taking AHCC and we're also doing things to improve estrogen metabolism and, you know, insulin resistance, uh, you know, how do we know if it's the supplement or if it's addressing the cost? We don't know if we're doing other things, but still very interesting. Um, now, her question, could it aggravate autoimmunity by stimulating the immune response? So I, I'm bringing this up because there is some controversy with mushrooms. And so she was wondering, would it be best to get immune disease in remission before trying to treat nodules with this? And I mean, I will say in theory, mushrooms might exacerbate autoimmunity, but I really haven't seen it. Who knows? Maybe there's people, there are people listening to this where it has been the case and everybody's different. So, I mean, here, this the same with like echinacea, for example, or elderberry that it boosts the immune system. So someone with autoimmunity want to take these, but I haven't seen it in practice where someone takes it and it worsens the autoimmunity, you know, Graves or Hashimoto's. So the honest answer though, is I'm not sure. So I don't want to say definitely take it if you have Graves or Hashimoto's, because I, I don't want to say not going to be a problem in everyone. And then someone takes it and it does exacerbate the autoimmune response. I'm not too concerned. I mean, I, one of my products I have, Autoimmune Supreme, which is a very popular product that supports liver, but also has immune support. And I've had a lot of people take it over the last year since it's been, it's been available now for a little over a year. And again, I don't think I've had anybody come back and say uh, that it's exacerbated their autoimmune response. Not only has a couple of mushrooms, so it's, uh, this one I forgot it has uh, has more than two, I believe. And so, again, maybe it's just the, what the ones that are in the autoimmune supreme, which are reishi and cordyceps, which seems to be be pretty safe. But maybe some of the others are more concerning. I do have an article on my website about mushrooms. Probably something I should also put into uh, and a podcast as well. Maybe I did. I, I forgot. <laughs> Again, I have so many 
so many articles in the past, but then also now a few hundred podcast episodes that I, I remember. I forget which one. Usually I remember, I don't know why I remember articles more, but probably because you a lot of times what I'll do is I'll repurpose the article, like I'll use some of the same information and turn it into a podcast. So rarely is it the opposite where I just create a podcast episode completely from scratch. You know, I've had the website Natural Inner Solutions for so long, 2010. So I've written about so many different things. That's probably why I'm usually confident that something's on the website, but not necessarily on the podcast. Another question, what are the important differences between thyroid cyst and nodules? So, I mean, thyroid cysts are fluid-filled nodules. I won't say always solid. Like, again, you won't always see solid, but a cyst is mostly fluid-filled, where a nodule is more on a solid side. Might might be a little bit fluid-filled, but... Yeah, I will say that nodules seem like they're like when some when a, you get a completely real like thyroid cyst, it's for whatever reason more challenging to to decrease. Like it just doesn't seem like it's the same causes as the regular thyroid nodules. And so uh, if it's really large, I'm not even sure if like radio frequency ablation is an option with that. But all right, so thanks for your questions, um, Audrey. I know some of you. I know. You, Others, like there are some that have like lots of questions. Again, I wish I could get every single question. Again, I'm getting into a lot here, even though there are others that I won't be able to answer because of time. Again, I will have a separate episode just focusing on questions related to hyperthyroidism. All right. So let me, I'm going to answer just a couple of more here. So Jan, actually, she has two questions, but one has already kind of been, what is the best way to lower thyroid antibodies and lower? C3. So again, and she has Hashimoto's, not on thyroid medication. I already, with the antibodies, definitely refer to samethyroid.com forward slash 50. And as far as reverse T3, I mean, that usually, again, I do have a podcast episode on reverse T3, an article on reverse T3. For hyperthyroidism, it's very common to have elevated reverse T3 and you need to lower thyroid hormones. For Hashimoto's, a lot of times you have problems converting T4 to T3. So you need to do things to help that conversion, support the liver, support the gut, for example, are some things that could be done. Um, lower cortisol levels could be factors. But again, I do have some information on that. And then I'll answer this um I will say protein. How much protein do you recommend daily? Because I didn't, I kind of touched upon that earlier when someone asked about supplement. I would say minimum. Some do advocate one gram of protein for each pound of ideal body weight. And I'm not saying people don't need that, but I usually recommend between 50 to 75% of their body. Like, for example, if someone is 120 pounds, then I would say between 50 and 75% of their weight in grams. So if they're 120 pounds, it would be between, I'm doing the math, it would be 60 to 90 grams, right? So 60, 50% would be 60 grams, 75% would be 90 grams. So I would say, I mean, and I would lean, I would lean towards a higher protein. Now, do does that person need 120 grams of protein? I'm not sure. There's so much conflicting information. I know I've had some people on my podcast say that they should have one gram of protein for every pound of ideal body weight. I can't say I agree with this at this point, but who knows? I'm, I might change in the future. I'll say I don't do that. I don't have like one gram of protein for every pound of ideal body weight that I have. You know, um, So my ideal body weight is like 165, 170. Again, I can't say I have that much grams of protein. Maybe I need it and I just don't know it and I'll change my stance in the future. But that's my stance currently. And at one thyroid group advocates taking thyroid hormone as a complete replacement instead of a small addition. And I'm not sure I understand the question. I mean... Obviously, I mean, in my opinion, you want to take the least amount possible if you do need to take, not everybody needs to take thyroid hormone if they have Hashimoto's, but you want to try to address the cause of the problem, hopefully don't need as much thyroid hormone. So Tom will be the last, actually has two questions. So let's wrap it up with these two questions here. So which supplement, and actually some of this, I'm going to just refer to the website because again, some of them are pretty general where it would take me like five to 10 minutes to answer a question. So like this first question, which supplements are better for hyperthyroid and hypothyroid? 
And again, I assume you're not at like bugleweed is more for hyper, but not hypo. But I don't think you're asking really that. You're asking like things like turmeric works for hypo, but not hyper according to your blood test. I would disagree. I would say, I mean, maybe it's according to your blood test, but I, I give a lot of my patients turmeric who have hyperthyroidism, including Graves' disease. I know there's some like years ago talks about like TH1 and TH2 balance with the immune system and certain herbs, like again, echinacea, okay for hyper, but not good for hypo or Hashimoto's, but ashwagandha. I've had a lot of people with hyperthyroidism and take ashwagandha, but there is some concern that it can increase hyperthyroidism in some cases, but it doesn't seem like that's the case. And if it does do that with hypo, then that's not necessarily a bad thing. I talk a lot about supplements on my website and, or again, maybe even like a future live events to get into where I could get into a little bit more detail, but then, okay. So this is the last question. Can other hormones produced by other glands like adrenals affect the thyroid? Yeah. I mean, definitely typically sex hormones. I mean, I won't say they won't affect thyroid. I mean, cause they kind of, they usually affect the immune system more thyroid. To answer your question, yes, adrenals without question can affect the thyroid hormones. And if you have a, especially like high cortisol levels, it could affect the conversion of T4 to T3 uh, and uh, it could result in like a lower T3, but also could affect the immune system, which could affect the thyroid. And then again, sex hormones typically won't affect thyroid directly, but will affect, I mean, not that it can't, but like someone asked about perimenopause and then you've got questions, can perimenopause, menopause affect the thyroid? Potentially it could, but it also affects the immune system, which could affect the thyroid. And again, there's episodes on that. It definitely went way over what I expected, which the reason I try to keep these short is, you know, so with the Tuesday episodes are longer they're meant to be longer. The Thursday episodes are meant to be short. And I have an editor. Part of the arrangement is that the Thursday episodes are shorter. Otherwise, I'd have to, like, again, just make different arrangements if they're long. Plus, again, it's very challenging coming up with content. This is not challenging, I'm just answering questions. But the purpose of Thursday mainly is to spend five, 10 minutes just answering a question, covering a single topic. So again, when it's longer like this, every now and then it's not a big deal when it comes to the editor, or at least I don't think it's a big deal, but again, uh, so I try not to abuse it, especially with another episode coming up, the Q and A, your hyperthyroid questions answered. Again, I don't abuse it, which I did a little bit here. So anyway, so these are all the questions I'll be answering during this episode. Again, in a couple of weeks, I'll be having another Q and A episode where I specifically answer questions related to hyperthyroidism. I hope you found this episode to be valuable. And as usual, look forward to catching you in the next episode. Thank you for listening to the Save My Thyroid podcast. If you haven't done so already, make sure you hit subscribe to stay up to date on the latest thyroid health-related topics. And to get your free thyroid and immune health restoration action points checklist, visit SaveMyThyroidChecklist.com. Thanks so much for tuning in. I want to let you know about a product called Hepatomune Supreme, which is a unique supplement that has a rare combination of N-acetylcysteine, also known as NAC, milk thistle, and schisandra to support the liver. And it also has a few mushrooms that can help support the immune system, including cordyceps, which has both immune modulating and adaptogenic properties and is great for those with Graves' disease and Hashimoto's. To learn more about Hepatomune Supreme, visit SaveMyThyroid.com forward slash liver support.